But today, we are going to go to the 27th Psalm. And I think you'll find encouragement from the verses we don't even focus on. So listen to me as I read the entire uh, verse. And let me say, I think these first couple of verses even help folks who are struggling with anxiety. Uh, there's a great book, and I'm going to order some more of them even to have on hand here to give away. It's a little paperback. Uh, how many of y'all remember here of a pastor named Charles L. Allen? He was a Methodist pastor in Houston. United Methodist pastor years ago. I mean, probably in the 60s or so. Probably a lot of, but, um, and he pastored somewhere else. He had a couple of big pastors. But he wrote a book called God's Psychiatry. And uh, basically, the 23rd Psalm and a few other uh, passages of Scripture, he had people constantly read them on a regular basis and let them sink into their heart and mind. That is so important that we let the Word of God sink into our heart. So again, I'm working with some people in the restaurant that some are not Christians, but they have had seasons that they've read the Bible. And, you know, even if a person, if you tried to witness to somebody and you can't get them to the point where they surrender to Jesus, encourage them to go to the Bible. <clears throat> they begin to read, God will often soften their heart, and you can then have deeper theological conversations with them. So let's go to uh, start with verse 1 of Psalm 27. It's In your Bible, it might be entitled, The Lord is My Light and Salvation, but we're going to deal today with seeking the Lord. I know that's not with the title of this message, but that's ultimately what we're going to get to, is seeking the Lord. Is Jesus in your life a vital necessity, or do you treat him as an optional accessory? If he's vital, you begin to seek him. So let's, let's, let's begin in the scriptures. I'm reading out of the English Standard Version. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war arise against me, yet I will be confident. One thing have I asked of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. Now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. And I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. And we have done that today, haven't we? Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud, be gracious to me and answer me. And here's our focal verse. You have said, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. And that's, that's the verse we want to focus on today, verse 8. You have said, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. And in the Amplified Bible, it puts it this way, the old Amplified with all the parentheses and brackets and things. Uh, and I don't have it on the screen. But it says, you have said... Seek my face, inquire for, and require my presence as your vital need. My heart says to you, your face, your presence, Lord, will I seek. Inquire for and require of necessity and on the authority of your word. And we just mentioned seeking the Lord. No one can come into the presence of God without an invitation. Jesus himself, our Lord Jesus, proclaimed in John 6, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. So there must be a supernatural work of grace in the heart to cause a person to want to seek God. And yet God does command us to seek his face. Just as Queen Esther could not come into the presence of Artaxerxes, uh, the Persian king, he, she, he could not come into his presence without him offering his scepter to her. So we cannot come into the presence of God unless he extends an invitation. But I got some good news. In today's passage, we hear such an invitation. The Lord has said, seek my face. Come on, seek me. Seek my presence, as it says in the Amplified. We hear it in other passages as well. Isaiah 55, 1. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and he who has no money, come by and eat. Verse 6 of that same chapter, uh, Isaiah 55, uh, says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Our Lord Jesus graciously and gloriously invites us in Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30, a verse that I share at almost every funeral I preach. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And then we go 
to Hebrews 4.16. And I'm going to read it out of the Amplified. Let us then fearlessly and confidently and boldly draw near to the throne of grace. That's the throne of God's unmerited favor to us sinners. That we may receive mercy for our failures. And find grace to help in good time for every need. That's appropriate help and well-timed help coming just when we need it. I'm finding in my life is God's meeting needs. And by the way, Brother Norman, we're talking about some needs that you have in your life. I'm finding out God will show up. That the key word there is appropriate help and well-timed help coming just when we need it. And I sure wish he'd show up early sometimes, but he never does. But he's never late. But if we cry out to him just when we need it, he's there. Well, the psalmist David did what we all need to do when he reminded himself to do what God commanded. He preached God's command to himself. Matthew Henry has said that's the best preaching. Hearing twice what God speaks once. Okay? He meditates on God's command to seek his face. And so I ask you, everybody here today, what do you seek? Are you enamored with all the lures of this world? Do you seek uh, the latest sports news? I have to be careful about that. That's why I love sports. Entertainment happenings, political trends, economic issues, or do you seek the Lord? Okay, Seeking the Lord is more than just taking a glance in His direction. We must stop glancing at Jesus and look intently at Him. Hebrews 12, 1 through 3 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, and chapter 11 talks, it's Hebrews Hall of Fame, talks about the Hall of Fame of people of faith. We're surrounded by those great cloud of witnesses. It said, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus. And it didn't say glancing at him. It didn't say taking it. It said looking. That means fastening our eyes. We're looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who... For the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. The Amplified Bible gives us an in-depth description of what God requires when we seek his face. It, it says to inquire for and require my presence as your vital need. Good King Asa of Judah, when he was instituting reforms in the land, commanded the people to seek the Lord, the God of their fathers. And again, if you go to the Amplified Bible, it digs into the Hebrew it tells us what Asa meant when he was seeking the Lord. It says, to inquire of and for him and crave him as a vital necessity. Do you crave him? Or is he just, well, I read my Bible a little bit and pray a little bit and, well, that's it, you know. Do we crave him? Do we desire fellowship with the Lord? Uh, the psalmist goes on. To say, and I didn't read verse 9, but if I go a little further from our scripture and go one verse down, it says, Hide not your face from me. Cast me not off. Forsake me not, O God of my salvation. He said, I need you, God. I need you. And in our day and time, don't we need the Lord more than ever? Yeah. Well, yes, everybody here has bought a car, has a car, some kind of vehicle. When, when buying a car, sometimes you'll be told that some cars come with optional accessories. And many things that people, you know, in today's society would consider to be necessities are really just accessories. And many things that folks take for granted are actually necessities. Like when it comes to buying a car, many people, I know y'all going to laugh at me here, would say that air conditioning is a necessity. Well, it actually is not, okay? Now, it's a really nice accessory, but think about it. You can get from point A to point B, and actually you can do the same way with heat. Now, I have to admit, if you're probably in Minnesota, you probably do need heat, okay? I mean, that's a little different. But uh, I was in Florida, and even when I've been here, I've had times that the heat didn't work in my car, okay? Now, I admit, if it gets to 40 below, you, you do probably need a heater in your car. But for many of us in America, and where we live, even here in Texas, you can make it without a heater. You may have to put on a coat. You may have to make sure you ladies aren't wearing a skirt, you know, that you wear, you know, something to fully clothed. But you can, that can happen. You can go from point A to point B. When I was in Florida, I had a heater core go out on me. Of course, we were in a fairly warm place. So a fellow helped me just bypass the whole deal. We just didn't have heat in the car anymore. Okay, so that was the end of that. Later, my air went out. But I could still go from point A to point B. But let me tell you what. You could uh, get in the car. You could crank it up. You could turn on your cool air. You've got an air conditioner. It works. You turn it on. It's cool. It's getting cool. You enjoy it. You go to put it in drive and discover the car will not go forward or backwards. 
you quickly understand that having a transmission that functions is a t- truly a necessity. But the air conditioning, eh, you know, if you had to make an emergency trip, uh, you can you can go. Now, as fast as I drive, I drive even faster when I don't have air because I, I got to keep it moving. I got to keep the air moving. I learned to roll every window down or crawl, at least crack all four of them and get a cross draft going. I've learned that you can do that. But you can make it. You can, okay? Uh, so likewise, today, many in the church have forgotten what is truly vital and necessary. So we need to heed God's word today. Allow the Spirit to reveal to us our true spiritual state because we don't always know it like we think we do. And then let's surrender to Jesus by making the necessary adjustments. That's why we've come to church, to be encouraged, to bless one another, worship the Lord, and make changes as God's word in the teaching time and in the preaching time comes to us. So let, let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask Him to open our hearts and minds. Heavenly Father, as I've given this introduction and shared with us what we're, the purpose and aim of this message is today, I need your help because these people don't need to hear stupid and foolish opinions that I might share. Yes, I've studied and I, I have some education, but Lord, I can easily misinterpret your word or, or even understand it myself, but, but poorly communicate it. So I ask that your spirit would go ahead of me and touch the hearts and minds of all who hear in this room, as well as those who be listening by ways on the internet uh, today, later today, and this week, and in the days and weeks, and who knows, even years to come. And I pray that they will hear your word clearly, Lord. And they will understand your word. That they will, I pray that you'll help me to communicate it as I should. We need your help. We need it in our nation. We need help uh, in our COVID crisis. We, we need deliverance from this. And Lord, we have sinned against you as a nation. We abort so many babies. We have, uh, you know, government has oppressed so many people, the poor. Uh, many people uh, are struggling. And there's other people who uh, have been uh, led to uh, almost live a life of uh, socialism and a life of uh, handouts, which is not good for them, Lord. Uh, we're just moving in a direction that's not good. But, Lord, you're the solution. Turning to you and turning to your teaching. So help us to be people filled with hope in the midst of a difficult world. Help our friends and neighbors and loved ones in other countries, especially our brothers and sisters in Christ, and help them. Help my friend Jacob Caffaro in Uganda. He's faithfully preaching your word and doing your will and uh, and ministering to needs in his community. Uh, There's so many others, Lord, that I have on my heart. And I pray that you'd help every true Christian pastor and teacher today to clearly communicate your word. May it go forth in power and bring about the needed change that we have. We ask this in Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. So let's begin here. Uh, we have three points, and we're going to move through them pretty quickly. Let's look at the nature of true worship. Seeking the face of God. It says in the Scripture, You have said, Seek my face. And so we see, where do we seek God's face? How do we do the true worship? Well, first of all, we do it among God's people. Okay, John Gill has said this, the great Puritan pastor, to seek the face of the Lord is to attend His house and ordinances where He grants His presence. And with this view, to enjoy His gracious presence and the light of His countenance, not being content with bare attendance without it. So let me stop there. Okay, to seek the face. It said we're to enjoy, the goal is to enjoy His gracious presence and the light of His countenance, and we would not be content to not have these things. So we're not just showing up today. Okay, not just showing up because it, I think for years many people in a very religious society showed up to church because it was just the thing to do. Okay, And they missed the whole blessing. That's not what we're to do. We're to seek the Lord, enjoy His gracious presence, come through in that today. In the light of His countenance, not being content with bare attendance without it, it is to seek the Lord Himself in communion with Him through Christ, the brightness of His glory and the angel of His presence. So we do that among God's people. We do that as we come together and you have your small group times on Sunday morning and Sunday school. Isn't that a blessing? And by the way, isn't it a blessing to even sometimes visit with one another and share testimony about what happened during the week? I've always got something that I'm sharing with some of you about what God did in my life this week or how He allowed me to witness to somebody or how somebody ministered to me. And you do the same for me when we talk and share. We need that. Also, The nature of true worship, seeking God's face, is through Christ. 
John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father by me. You want to come and seek the face of God, you've got to go through Jesus. That is vital. That is important. But not only is it through Christ, we are to be personally desiring to experience God. Moses said in Exodus 33, 18, please show me your glory. Of course, God said, you couldn't handle it if I did. So he said he hid Moses in the cleft of the rock. And Moses got to see the part of God's shadow go across. And then he comes down from the mountain and his face is just glowing. He had to put a veil on, you know. His face was glowing from the presence of God. So it's okay to say, God, reveal yourself to me before you go to the Word of God and read it each day. And I hope that you do that. To read it, not just as a... And again, what works for one of you may not work for somebody else. Maybe you need to be on a five-year plan to read through the Bible. Maybe you need to... uh, Maybe some of you, I think Jennifer did it a little while back. Jennifer, didn't you read through the Bible within a few months one time? Or maybe you didn't do that one. She did some other program. But I know there's even a program where basically in about six weeks you read through the entire Bible. You have to read about an hour and 15 minutes a day. And that's not going to work for some of you. You don't have that time. But, but try different ways of doing it, okay? But read it. Old and New Testament. God is, you want to hear from God? Here it is. God will speak to you, okay? And then, yes, He will impress things on your heart, but how do you know that it's biblical or right unless you know what this says, okay? So I'll ask you, Brother Mike, well, I may not be able to get to the phone or text you, you know. You're welcome to ask me, but I may not be able to get there. Uh, Read it. Study it. Desire. Personally desire to do this. Pray. Ask God for this. Show me your glory. And God did it for Moses, and He'll do it for you. He'll answer that prayer. He, he wouldn't tell you to seek Him and not, not honor it. But we not only have the nature of true worship, we have the nature of this invitation. It is a serious invitation. But you know why it's serious? Because I should have put this in parenthesis and I didn't do, I mean in, in italics. You have said. That's a part of the scripture. You have said. Okay. See, both John Gill and Matthew Henry attest to the fact that God never commands. Seek you me in vain. God is serious about the invitation that he offers. I've already read for you Matthew 11, 28 through 30. Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. I'll give you rest. Matthew 7, verses 7 and 8. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open. For to everyone who asks receives, everyone who seeks finds, and everyone who knocks, the door is open. That's real. In John 7... Verses 37 through 39, Jesus had said that the one who would come to Jesus out of his innermost being would flow rivers of living water. He said this would happen if you would call out unto him. Isaiah 55, verse 6 says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. You know, I'm not quoting that right, and I'm going to go back and make sure I quote that right. I'm getting... It says, it says, yes, I'm right. Seek the Lord while he may Call upon him while he is near. Then in verse 11, he says, his word would not return to him void. So the word I'm preaching today, I'm, I'm challenging you to seek the Lord. And if you do that, you'll find him. You will find him. So God never says, seek you me in vain. If he says, seek me, you'll find him. I promise you. He'll be found. He'll, at some point, he's going to show up and say, here I am. You have found me. And you'll rejoice in Him. And you'll glory in Him. And you'll be blessed. Charles Spurgeon has put it this way. The voice of the Lord is very effectual where all other voices fail. You know. And by the way, we need to have a confidence in the Lord. I think this is the problem with a lot of preaching today. I I have sat under, and Jennifer can attest to this, we've sat under in a church when we were in Florida. They were one of the best Bible teachers we've ever heard. And my soul is still nourished from things that I've said. I've sat under other guys and other people that they wasted my time. I remember one time texting a friend and saying, i got to get out of this church because this is, this is just terrible. You know, I mean, uh, the gospel's not being preached. And it wasn't that heresy was being preached. There was just silliness and foolishness going on. When the Word of God, man, I'm scared to get up here sometimes and preach the Word of God. And I would take it lightly. And I'm pretty hard on fellow preachers. They don't have to be gifted. They don't have to have great oratory skills. They can stumble all over themselves. They can be poor readers. But I need them to preach the Word of God. 
I don't need to hear their, their silly stories. I don't need to hear. And not that all these people are bad. They mean well. But the difference is they don't have confidence in this. I'm not smart enough to help y'all. You don't need a psychology lesson. You don't need, I mean, go watch Dr. Oz or Dr. Phil if you want that, you know. Go see a good therapist, you know. They can probably help you a little bit. But this, this is life-changing. This will change your life. And so seek God. Don't seek Him in vain. God's Word is very effective where all other voices fail. Now, I don't have confidence that I can help you by myself. Uh, it's only th- it's the Lord works through me. So also God calls by numerous means. And I'm going to give you a few of them real quickly. Number one, His Word. Psalm 119, 105. Thy Word is a lamp unto my feet and light unto my path. We have the witness of the Spirit. And I marked this, boy, this passage out. I marked it out, then I took my bookmark out. But here it is. Uh, no, uh, John 14, verse 26. Jesus says, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to remembrance all that I have said to you. So the Holy Spirit, his witness, will teach us about God, teach us about Jesus, how to seek him, how to know him. And then there's opportunities for worship. Okay, we see that in Hebrews 10, 25. Forsake not the assembly of yourselves together, as is the manner of some, uh, especially as we see the day of the Lord approaching. We get closer to Jesus coming back because it goes on to say that we're here to nourish and encourage one another and build up one another as we see the day of the Lord approaching. So, and that's not, I, again, I don't preach that risk to fuss at people. Why are you at church today? It's more, hey, I missed you. I want you to be at church today, you know, uh, and, and we just, this wasn't the same without you. We need your encouragement. We want to encourage you in the Lord. That's why it was an admonition, not, you know, Paul wasn't taking, they didn't have hardback Bibles and that day and beat people upside the head and say, come on church. It was, hey, come on. We need you. We desire you. We miss you because it's an opportunity for us to worship the Lord and seek the Lord together. There's also special providences, okay? And those are merciful providences. We see that in uh, Acts chapter 2. And there was a lot of ways. It says at the end of that chapter, verses 42 through the end of the chapter, how they shared all things in common. They helped one another. Somebody had a need. They, they, you know, they, they were there. They served one another. They were merciful. There was a mercy ministry going on. God also works with us in afflictive ministries. Remember I preached to y'all a few weeks back, a few months ago, Isaiah 29, 11. I said what the real... Interpretation of that verse was, you know, that I know the thoughts I have for you, thoughts to give you a future and a hope. Those people were in bondage. They had sinned against God and had been sent to Babylon. By the way, Americans, even American Christians, have been sent to God. It seems like Babylon is coming into our own land. Okay? It's happening. Okay? God is going to be with his people. Uh, I know we, we see a lot of wickedness around, and one of the things I want to challenge you is look at your own life and repent of sins in your own life. I can't repent for anybody else. I can't. I just can't repent for them. I can't, and staying mad at them is not going to help either. Okay? I need to pray for them. Maybe I even need to tell them at times, hey, it's not good. That's, God doesn't honor that kind of behavior. Don't do that. But I can't repent for them, but I can repent for me. Right. Judgment begins at the house of God. 1 Peter 4, 17. You know, God's going to deal with us first. And the reason we have over the last hundred years from the various political parties, the reason we have so many losers that we voted for is we, not just recently, it's been years ago, we started a trickle of voting for people who would give us more money, who would pander to whatever we wanted, and really weren't righteous. That didn't just start last 5, 10, 20 years. That started over a hundred years ago. And uh, like a frog that was boiling in the pot. And, uh, but... We can always repent and turn to the Lord. And things can turn around. But we'll have to repent and do that. But uh, since God had stirred up David to seek his face, you know, King David was confident that God was going to reveal himself to him. So this happened. God revealed himself to him. We see here that the nature of true worship, we see the nature of this invitation is a very serious one. But now lastly, let's look at the surrender of a grace-touched so, man, y'all shocked that I got through point three at 12 minutes to 12. And y'all just, y'all, and I promise that we're not going to languish at least because we've got communion here in just a moment. And uh, 
you got notes, take these, write some notes down besides the blanks there, and, uh, and, and meditate on this. But the surrender of a grace-touched soul toward this invitation, David says here in this passage, Your face, Lord, do I seek. So listen to me. It's more than mere talk. Okay. Thomas Aquinas said this, Sometimes a man petitions for something with his mouth, but his heart is engaged in other things. Mmm. Oh, does that happen to us sometimes? Our talk been better than our walk. Okay. I really want to serve the Lord. And it's not just with the Lord, it's with anything. You know, I really love my spouse, love my family. You know, talk about how much I love the Lord. Ah, that doesn't happen. Sometimes we can talk about what we want, but you know, if, you know, if you find yourself and by the way with our tablets and our phones, we can watch so many things. Do we go down the rabbit hole of uh, and again some of the things we watch are not bad. You may listen to gospel music. I mean, I can get really enamored in that. I, I have to be careful of going down that YouTube rabbit hole, you know. Or I'm a person that likes to seek knowledge. I'm, I'm just a, I'm a trivia kind of person. I have all kinds of useless stuff up in my brain that ain't going to help anybody. And I have to be careful whether it's Facebook or YouTube or even Instagram or any of those. you got to put some limits on what. I even had a time in one church where I served that I had Facebook. I actually had an Internet filter. I had Facebook blocked off of it. So while I'm working, I just couldn't go there. Uh, not because there was anything wicked I was doing, just wasting time, you know. So right, you know, don't, 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 don't put put something in place that you don't waste your time, okay? Because we need to do the Lord's work. Let me just tell you some people who did step out in faith, and this one guy we might even be tempted to criticize him because his faith wasn't super strong. But Peter stepped out in faith and walked on the water with Jesus at the Lord's invitation in Matthew fourteen twenty nine. We think about how Peter fell. Hey, at least he got out of the boat. And sometimes somebody gets out of the boat and fails, don't we? Well, we I, see, you look at that. They, they, they weren't the Christian they, I thought they were, that they thought they were. Hey, they got out and tried something for God. They failed, but they got out and tried, and Jesus picked them up and rescued them. Was a, and I was mentoring, had this guy that he's wanting to bring into his mentorship group, and, you know, as I told him, I have no money to pay for this. You know, if you want me to be in it, uh, you know, it's fine. I think you could help me. You've already helped me with some advice you've given he said, well, I think I'm going to scholarship you in. And he was just mentioning that we try a lot of things. Some of you businessmen have tried things and they didn't work. But you tried. At least you tried. That's good. I mean, some people don't try. So if you try for the Lord and step out in faith, you may falter in it, but at least you didn't just talk about it. I'm finding out, and I know these kids don't, but Sam doesn't believe it. Probably Donna, Dominic doesn't. JJ and Bentley, they don't believe this. But there's a day that time will start passing by real fast. I know right now. Well, how old are you, JJ? Are you seven? Eight. Eight, okay. Now, I remember when I was eight years old. Time just seemed to take forever. You know, I, I just realized a few weeks ago, I mean, y'all know we're, we're halfway through all of us. You know, I had some things I was working on two months ago, and I'm like, wow. I had really gotten done with these business goals. Where would I be today? I wasted some time. And so that was one thing in my mentorship group. It's I got to block out. It's sort of hard when you work for yourself. Sometimes you you know I don't have you know I can't fire me you know and uh, you know to, I've got you know I'm having to work on some things so that it doesn't just become talk. It becomes action and do some action. And some of my mentors have said, hey, start some things. Don't wait. I started this business and spirituality Facebook group. Well. I ain't doing all that I want to do on it, but you are seeing me post a few things. Why? Because at least I'm doing some action. i got bigger goals, but you're never going to get to the big goal unless you start doing the little things. So keep doing them. Step out in faith. Isaiah proclaimed in Isaiah 6, when he saw the Lord, he came into the presence of God, and he heard God's glorious request. Uh, who will go for us? He said, here am I. Send me. If you get into the presence of the Lord, it'll be more than talk. You'll want to go for Him. Let me close out with an exhortation from the late evangelist, Ralph Barnard. And JoJo has picked a good time to be a little loud because I'm going to channel Ralph Barnard. He was an old, hardcore kind of preacher, okay? So I can get a little loud right here because Ralph Barnard got a little loud. Here's an exhortation that he gave. He said, if an old hell-bound sinner is ever brought to the place where he knows that he's lost, 
Because the Holy Ghost has pricked him in his heart by the Word of God and revealed to him his sinful condition, he will beg God to have mercy on him. And when God is pleased to make him a new creature in Christ, he will be in love with the lover of his soul and will delight to do the will of God and walk in loving obedience to him. Now, I'm not channeling Brother Bernard real well because he was a lot louder than this and even yelled a little bit when he preached. He said, we've got a stuff called salvation that makes the death of the Lord Jesus Christ a joke. It makes God a minister of sin and speaks peace to men where there is no peace. It's filling hell full of church members who believe the lies that are being preached. The only people who will bring praise and glory to Christ are those who are under the guiding hand and rule of Him whom God appointed to be Lord over all mankind. I say that the gospel is a holy-making gospel, and we do not live a holy life in order to be saved, but we live a holy life because we are saved. And when a man is justified by the blood of Christ, that is the beginning of a holy life. That's where holy living starts. And that person who's not on the road to the time when he will be like Christ is traveling on the wrong road. Christ is not his Lord. In the churches today, this was probably in the 1960s when he said this, Christ is offered to men and women as one who will keep you out of hell and let you do as you please. But the Lord Jesus Christ of God's word demands holy living. If sin is damning its thousands, religion today is damning its tens of thousands. So he says, so what a miracle it will be if God ever fixes you so that you'll not just attend services, but will you begin to listen to God's Word? I've been preaching all these years to a generation of people who seem to wish to trust in the work of Christ without falling in love with Him. And hell is full, thus hell is full of people who believe the fact but we're not joined to a person. But we talked about that in Sunday school today, didn't we? Relationship, didn't we? For all his hard preaching, Ralph Bernard was not a legalist. He wasn't worried about you quitting chewing tobacco or smoking cigarettes. So he didn't think those things were good. But he wasn't worried about that. He was worried about you knowing Jesus. Amen. And let Jesus fix the rest of it. So he says, what does a sinner expect when he doesn't desire to be under the rule of Christ? Well, he says, I can't understand that type of salvation. What does a sinner expect when he doesn't desire to be under the rule of Christ, but continues to rebel against that rule? I cannot understand a salvation that turns out men and women who do not intend in the deep recesses of their souls become willing bond slaves of our Lord Jesus Christ. I say to you, my friend, that church members who live in known sin, who do not pant after holiness, who have no love for Christ, I say to you, they are in mortal danger, and they are on the road to hell, and know it not. And that was from his sermon why Christ died. I'm exhausted. I couldn't preach like that all the time. But he could. I don't know. And, and uh, wow, he was, but he was passionate about Jesus. And the point is, well, I'm here to fuss at you, but I'm just here to say we've got to do more than mere talk. We've got to seek the Lord. So quickly, let me finish here by two more points. We need a prompt response. When the Lord speaks, we don't hold back. Charles Spurgeon said, Oh, for more of this holy readiness, would to God that we were more plastic to the divine hand, more sensitive to the touch of God's Spirit. I know that we have hard plastic today, but Spurgeon's style plastic was very flexible. Oh, that God could, we would be surrendered and let Him flex us. It says we also need a personal response. The call was general. But like David, we must apply it to ourselves. Okay, to ourselves. Is it coming up here, J.B.? Okay, there you go. All right. Matthew Henry puts it this way. You put this on the screen too. The Word does us no good when we transfer it to others, but do not ourselves accept the exhortation. I could be thinking today, man, Julie needs to hear this today. She just really needs to hear this, and I miss it. And who knows? She may need to hear it. You know? She may need to, and that may be true. Now, I'm not saying that. I'm using her as an example. But how does it hit me? Because I can't. If she does need all I do is pray about it. Lord, I pray that you receive this today. But then, Lord, help me to receive this. Because if I'm noticing her, I, I probably need more she does. You know? So look to yourself, okay? Do that. Yes, if you see that, that hey, this would really help so-and-so. Sometimes I've said, so-and-so should have been here today. I just know that, that would have helped them. I know about problems in their life. But you know what? I promise you, these messages hit me before they ever hit you when I preach them. They do. So let me just conclude here, and then we'll have our Lord's Supper. But friend, I want to ask y'all something. And all of y'all are my friends. And if you're listening, by the way, the internet, you're my friend too. Thank you for being here. Will you wave the flag of surrender and seek the Lord on His terms? Will you do that? 
Will you forsake the sewer water of this world and drink the life-giving water that Jesus offers that will refresh your soul on a daily basis? And if you don't know Christ, if you never surrender to Him, look to Him, don't glance at Him, seek Him. And the Christian daily submit to Jesus. The Apostle Paul said in I think it's 1 Corinthians 15, 29, I die daily. Every day I die to myself and live to the Lord. Come daily, drink this living water, live in the fullness of the Spirit. That doesn't mean your life will be easy. It just means when all you know what breaking loose around you, you can have the joy of the Lord. Okay? That's right. That doesn't mean you're happy and bouncing up and down all the time, but you'd say, I know God's in control. I know Jesus loves me. I've heard from the Lord today. Amen. The great man of prayer that ran the orphanages in England, George Mueller, you may have heard of him. He was a man that would pray for the needs of it. He didn't go out and ask for a lot of help. They needed supplies and stuff. He'd just get on his face and seek God and ask for it. And God would lay it on people's heart to bring food to the orphanage and other things. But he's had a saying that said, I don't get my day started, I get happy in the Lord. And you know, maybe we need to break out that Bible. Pray. Get happy in the Lord before we get up and go to work. For you kids, get up and go to school. Get up and get happy in the Lord. Get up a few minutes early. Die daily to the flesh and personally know Christ. So as our, our musicians come, I ask you, is Jesus your vital necessity or is He just an optional accessory? If I were to ask your family, your friends, your co-workers, your teammates, what would, your classmates, what would their answer be based on the way they see you?